All right, so let's look at, uh, let's get in our paleo dune buggies and put our seatbelts on, and we'll take a little drive around what we have found uh, during this project. So what is life like in the Nugget Desert, in and on the sand dunes? Um, so the, as I said, the bulk of the formation preserved are these dunes, and they are represented by these big cross-bedded um, horizons. And an interesting thing about dunes is how they're formed and they move. So air blowing, wind blowing up along the slope gets to the top and the air velocity drops in this area and it dumps sand on the front. And so you really, what we have inside these um, fossil sand dune deposits, all we have are the front sections of the dunes. And as wind direction changes or wind velocity drops for some period of time, uh, you will get these flatter surfaces in here, and then the next dune system develops. And you can, this is an idealized diagram, but you can actually see this quite well in the field where we have, use the dune fronts, there's the horizontal beds that are truncated, another set of dunes here, another set of dune there. And we'll look quickly at this one particular site in Dinosaur, which gave us a really good view, kind of plain on, of what the fronts of these dunes were like. So you can see here are the oops, here are the dune slopes of the dune beds. Uh, they're a little bit steeper because of the tilting of the rock unit. But there's I and a co-researcher looking at one of those dune fronts, and in an area about 15 square meters, it's covered with somewhere around 400 footprints. Um, and these are all very small, and they're made. Uh, they're, they have the the, the uh, trapway name of Brazilipnium. They're small four-toed tracks. Uh, at the University of Utah, up in the uh, geology building, there's a spectacular slab on exhibit in the second floor. And this is a photo of it. It is covered, once again, with hundreds of these brass lithium trackways. But the most interesting thing is a series of trackways here and here, which are actually animals coming down the slope. Almost everything we have seen in the field and in the literature are these animals walking up the fronts of the slope. And this is uh, this slide is important. George Engelmann and I published that last year in uh, Paleontological Electronica. The, the, the deformation that you get of the sediments of the animal walking down the slope is strikingly different than what you see when the animal is walking up the slope. So um, it's quite easy to orient yourself when you're looking at the slab or you're at the field looking at the surface. And the interesting thing, story about this slab is that in 1922, Buss in LDS Improvement Age magazine published a, pa a short paper about tracks from the Nugget Sandstone around Hoover in Utah. And one of the things he published uh, in this short paper um, was this trackway slab, and you can see the same kind of deformation in the sediment deformation on the tracks. This is a downward, downward uh, an animal walking down the slope. And this specimen is lost. Nobody knows where it is or whatever happened to it from 1922. That was the only occurrence in the literature until George Engelman and I, coming to look at something in the collections in the geology building, stepped out of the elevator on the second floor, the door opened, and there was that huge slab with all the downward tracks on it. So sometimes the best hunting really is in these ones. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the present lithium trackers are probably made um, by some kind of mammal-like reptile, tritylodons, or a kind of thing that's been suggested. But we, uh, other than that, we're not really too sure about the track makers, and uh, just ignore these guys <laughs> for reasons you'll find out later. <laughs> but we also, on that same big surface uh, area that George had the picture of on the slab with, we also find uh, other kinds of trackways. So here's a long, it's a trackway that's total length of about five feet and it has these three-toed impressions on, or at least they might look at first as though they're toe impressions, but they're really uh, leg impressions, and these are the tracks of large scorpions. Uh, the track is named Paleo Helcura, and uh, I brought a cast of this, of that five-foot slab I have over here we can look at at the uh, end of the session, if you're interested. We also find these peculiar trackways where you have um, reverse triangles of tracks on each side, and this is something called octopodicness that is probably made by large desert-dwelling spiders. And I also brought a cast of a 
three or four foot trackway of one of these over here that we can look at if you're interested. And then we have these flat bedding surfaces that without having walking traces on it are covered with either burrows that are perpendicular to the surface, as you see here, or they're long and parallel to the surface. And these are formed in modern day dune um, environments by the larvae of various <coughs> kinds of beetles and flies. Now keep in mind, we have no body fossils of any of these animals anywhere in the nut. All of this record is coming from looking at footprints and trails and burrows. And then finally, this is at Moonshine Arch, which is north of Vernal, um, a visitor site in um, on BLM land. And we find these long burrows that cut across the dune beds. And they're up to a meter in length. They're filled in differently than the surrounding rock. And at one place up by Moonshine Rocks, each of these dots is representing one of the, one of the burrows that we found in varying lengths. We have somewhere almost three dozen of these things preserved in this one area. And then we've only seen them once or twice in very limited numbers anywhere else out there. But at Moonshine Arch, they're spectacularly exposed. And these are burrows that are either made by large scorpions or um, small uh, reptiles or primitive mammals. It's not possible to tell from the geometry of the uh, borough who the, who the likely maker is, and it's within the size range for either of these. And then there would be no good paleo expedition without some problems. And so we do find these peculiar kind of basketball-sized masses of burrows that all intersect one another. And uh, at first we thought they were some kind of colonial and social insect nest. But they're actually not burrows. You can see the backfill where the animals were burrowing through the sand and pushing the sand behind them. And uh, we had um, some graduate students worked on this as part of an invertebrate trackway or invertebrate fossil study in the nugget. And the conclusion was nobody knew what the hell was going on here. <laughs> um, but they are really interesting. <laughs> and the other thing is these are kind of chemical fossils. So the finer grained sandstone. Uh, get holds the red hematite minerals that come in with the groundwater. So if you did not have this hematite staining in there, you probably wouldn't even see these things. So they may be much more common, but in bleached exposures, you can't even tell them. All right, so what's life like in between the dunes? Uh, we have some areas that are pretty wet. This is a uh, carbonate or a limestone dome um, at one of our sites. It's about a meter high. And in fact, in a small area, there's four of these things in sequence. And these are spring heads where water was coming up out of the sand and bubbling out and starting to flow into low areas. And it builds up in the area that they come out, and that's why you have these domes. And associated with these, we find various kinds of fossils. Um, in some places, we have these limestones that have what's called a stromatolytic texture, which means that there were uh, mats of algae and um, microbes that are growing on the surface and they're eventually being covered up and new layers are growing. Um, but there are no fossils in there. You've already seen kind of the sedimentary effect of the organisms. And then associated with these, as I said, we have different kinds of burrows. Um, we're not sure who all these uh, makers are. This is a this looks like a burrow that's only known for marine sediments. Obviously there's this is not a marine sequence of some of the kind of animals making this. And then we have areas that are interdunal and have wet at some parts of the time, but we don't have any limestone beds associated with them. And these are all really heavily bioturbated sandstone layers uh, with hundreds upon hundreds of dinosaur tracks stepping on one another. So we have these small tridactyl trackways that are made by small theropods. We have larger ones that are made by larger theropods. And then we have these odd, long, elongate five-toed tracks that are probably made by prosauropods, kind of the ancestors of the giant herbivores. And then finally, we're able to actually say something about life in the oases because um, we were quite lucky in our field work and made a really important discovery. It is almost impossible to say how rare to overstate how rare bone fossils are in the Nugget of Navajo or the Aztec sandstone. Um, 
So if, when you're in the museum, you should go see this specimen that's on exhibit. It's a beautiful prosauropod skeleton that came out of the Navajo sandstone in southern Utah, and there are not many of those to see in museums. But our discovery involved this site. So um, all these beds are tilted about 30 degrees. Um, and here are these huge dune bed deposits above and below. And what caught our eye was this thin interval in here, which it was actually originally horizontal. Uh, so right away, seeing something that wasn't a dune deposit attracted our attention. And that resulted in the discovery of the saints and sinners quarry. Uh, and this has been a long-term project. Uh, we've been working with collectively, that's George Engelman um, on the right, and Ian Center, and Brooks Britt from BYU on um, the other side. And there's some debate uh, in the scientific community as to <laughs> which, exactly who is who here. <laughs> and it is important to make sure you do not confuse this with the Saints and Sinners Private Member Club, which was located on South State Street here for a number of years, and now uh, they've gone out of business, they've been renamed. <laughs> and the original discovery we made uh, at the site, George and I went over, walked up on a surface, and there was bone everywhere. And it's bone like this. It was partially sticking out of the rock. It was uncompressed and uncracked. We could look at this and tell you these are dorsal vertebrae of ferropod dinosaurs without doing anything at all. And it probably the day we found it just walking around, identifying discrete bones, we probably saw as many bones on the surface that have been totally collected out of the desert ecosystem historically. And this turns out to be an amazing site. We've got over 18,000 bones and bone fragments, um, over 20 uh, individuals of small predatory coelophysory dinosaurs. We have these uh, near crocs that are uh, long limb terrestrial runners. We have over 40 skeletons of these. Um, Spenodonts and procolophonids, which are kind of look lizard like, although they're not really. Uh, we have a basal pterosaur and a bunch of these really weird beasts called apanosaurs. Uh, a lot of the material, not all, but a lot of the steel physeroid material is totally disarticulated. <coughs> these things die. They're in this uh, oasis lake, and the skulls just fall apart on the sutures. There's almost no transport. A lot of these bones are only a few millimeters thick, but they're uncrushed, they're not broken. Um, and and uh, they cat scan really quite well, so we're getting some interesting data. Uh, occasionally we find uh, partial skeletons, so this was like the second year we were working there, and uh, this whole thing right here is the back half of a juvenile coelophysoid that's about a meter long. As I said, we have uh, fragments of things called for colophonids up here on the top, and spendodonts, which are still alive down below, uh, and they look superficially, most people would think that they look lizard-like, but they're not true lizards. The most unexpected uh, thing we found were these drapanosaurs, um, which, which are a very, very weird group of reptiles. There's three skeletons, one there, one there, and another one over here. This is the only time anyone has ever found more than one drapanosaur skeleton at a time, and no one has ever found them in desert environments before. And they are the best candidate for extraterrestrials that I think we have ever found. <laughs> Even having multiple complete skeletons, and between George Brooks and I, probably 60 years worth of vertebrate paleontology ex experience, we can look at a skeleton and point and say, what the hell bone is that? And they modified their body in many incredible ways. Uh, they have a, really, a spike at the end of their tail, these giant hands with these immense single claws um, on the fingers, and very, very bizarre. Uh, and then we have, like I said, these uh, small terrestrial crocodiles. We have over 40 specimens. They're spectacularly preserved and articulated, uh, preserved in three dimensions. Terrestrosuchus is something from Europe that probably looks similar to these. And then the second most unexpected thing was we've got most of the disarticulated skull of a flying reptile called a pterosaur. So up here is kind of a, this is dimorphodon, but we've colored in green all the parts that we have of this. And while we don't have much of the skeleton behind the skull, um, that's fine, because the most interesting part of the skeleton is the skull of fact. Uh, it's most closely related to, to, to Dimorphodon, which is from the lower Jurassic of Europe. If we look at the late Triassic record for pterosaurs, they're almost all known 
um, from uh, Western Europe in shallow marine environments. And here, the saints and sinners specimen is hundreds of kilometers in from the nearest shoreline in the middle of a vast desert. And uh, it extends the known range of pterosaurs in desert environments back by 50 million years, which shows you how really bad the pterosaur record is. Um, these bones are just amazingly thin, like they're made out of tissue, but they cat scan well, so we've got, once again, great, great data. And while it may seem odd to be having lakes in desert and dune field systems, they do occur in the modern day world um, in Inner Mongolia and in China. Some of these can be quite large. Here's one you can see lots of vegetation around the margin. Uh, these must have been in existence for some time because while pterosaurs could fly and coelophysaurs could wander around, uh, drapanosaurs would be pretty clunky walking around. So they're, they're, uh, how they got into these systems is a bit of a puzzle. And these are in large, like I said, large dune systems. So if you look at this jeep here, and then we look at another shot of this, the arrows pointing to the jeep, these can be really, really big desert systems. And then just let me say a few words about life before the desert. Um, so below the Nugget Sandstone is the Chinle, which is a fully self-respectable formation with river deposits and lakes and floodplains and forests. And the bottom 10 meters of the nugget are a transition zone where things are getting progressively drier as you go up, but you are not yet up into the full-blown uh, dune system. And at the, in this bottom interval, we see all kinds of um, ripple mark surfaces. This turbulent, this messed up area here, so those are all uh, various kinds of reptile tracks that have been churning up the sediments. It's a very wet environment. Uh, the most common tracks are probably Brachypyrotherium, which are made by an Aetosaur, one of the large armored herbivorous reptiles. Uh, we get those at several different sites. And yes, also do get small theropod trackway sites, which are probably ground. So, what are the conclusions of um, this project they've been working on? Uh, the transformation from the Chinle ecosystem um, to the vast dune complex of the Nugget takes place over a considerable period of time. There's some 10 meters of deposition from one environment to the other. And the vertebrate fauna of this transition zone, at least so far as we know, are based on evidence are and small theropods. The Nugget sandstone was extensively uh, was extensive and dominated by dune fields, but the Nugget does preserve a variety, a mosaic of environments, including Dune fields, wet interdunal areas such as oases, lakes, etc., and then drier or not permanently wet uh, interdunal areas. And when we combine the entire trace and body fossil record from the nugget uh, in our study area, it gives us some insight into ecological segregation between these different communities. So in the dune fields, uh, the record's completely composed of tra trace fossils, tracks and trails, um, composed of tritylodons, scorpions, and spiders. And when we are in the oases, we have a totally different fauna of dinosaurs, uh, terrestrial crocodilians, pterosaurs, these lizard-like forms, and these uh, alien drapanosaurs. So the wet in the wet interdual areas, um, they're rare, but they can have locally extremely abundant skeletal deposits. The tracks of animals found in um, those beds are not the tracks that we find. The animals that are in those uh, areas are not the animals making the tracks out in the desert. And animals that make the tracks in the dune fields do not appear in any of the bone deposits or interdunal inter areas. So based on the known record from the study area, it looks like there's some fairly marked ecological segregation within the Nugget Sandstone Desert. And thanks to uh, numerous federal agencies and interns, uh, and researchers from institutions all uh, working on this project, and I would be glad to take any questions. <laughs> yes? Is that entire sand sea uh, a continuous, uh, does it have a continuous formation? Or well, the source, or yeah, the source is for these sediments. Um, are actually the Appalachians. So there's a big Amazon-like river system that's bringing um, 
sand and picking up across the Canadian Shield and dumping it in Western Canada, and then it's blowing down into the Western US. And so as this dune system grows, it first grows kind of on its northern part of the range as the sand is blowing in. So those areas up there are older than the exposures all the way down in Arizona. Um, so they're, they're not, it, just didn't, it didn't form all at once over that huge whole area. And in some places, it looks like it may have been in place for 10 million years. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm wondering where the nugget sandstone and the Aztec sandstone fit in with the nugget sandstone. Oh, okay. The They're all roughly uh, contemporaneous and part of one system. The problem is we don't have continuous exposures to trace. So the, the names are really geographical. So the stuff to, up to the north where we are is called the Nugget Sandstone. And then the bulk of it kind of in the middle of the Intermountain West, we just got the name Navajo Sandstone. And then at the very bottom down in Arizona, it's called the Aztec. And we're not sure how those all relate to one another. We don't know that they're all contemporaneous or equivalent, but they are all part of this one huge desert ecosystem. Yes? Oh, uh, is that the first? Um, evidence of drapanosaurs outside of Eurasia? I've never heard of drapanosaurs. Yeah, they're in the Chin Li. In fact, um, Randy's collected some, right? Down yep. Chin Li. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and there was a recent paper published on a skull out of Chin Li. Interesting. Thank you. But, but they're not, they're also, no, no one really expected them, I think, to be uh, all the way on the other side of the globe. But they have turned up, and it could be that there's lots of drapanosaur bits in collections in little boxes that say problematic <laughs> because they are baffling and only if you start spending some time looking at them you can start to recognize uh, less complete specimens. Yeah? Is the lack of like bone fossils in the sand region or do the like do the, do the are those environments back to fossilization or is there just not a lot of biomass? Uh, we don't have any bones um, out of the dune system. So we just have tracks. But it, undoubtedly, the things that are making the grass licking tracks are living out there, maybe in between the dunes or on the bases of the dunes. So somewhere out there, if we all three of us walk around long enough, one day we'll come up on the surface and then we'll be all these burrows full of grass licking and skeletons sitting in them. Um, but we don't see any dinosaur tracks out there, and it's hard to imagine dinosaurs making much of a living out there. Uh, there's just, it's not that complex of food web, I think, with enough food for them. So there is a bias um, in terms of preservation of skeletons. Uh, and there are dinosaurs that get buried by collapsing dunes on occasion, but um, I think they're just, they're ecologically segregated. Let's thank Barry.